Good morning and happy Friday to everyone joining our community call. Very excited to welcome everybody that's uh, sliding into the call today. We will be uh, starting the call immediately this morning, actually at uh, 9.01 on the hour. So <clears throat> wanted to give everybody a chance to uh, just settle in. And while we're sliding in, I just wanted to get a quick mic check from Ash and make sure my screen share is available. Looking good. Good morning, everybody. All right. Happy Friday. And away we go. I want to thank everybody again. A lot of great uh, faces. I love to see every Friday on the call. Um, also want to welcome so many new people onto our call today. Uh, just kind of perusing all the PFPs that we have in the crowd. And <laughs> what a great collection. We um, always host our community calls every Friday here in the Discord. Um, love to invite special guests onto the stage. Um, but I also encourage everybody that's joining for the first time today, please uh, take a look at our Discord channels. We strongly encourage contributions. We love uh, contributors. We love uh, technicals, non-technicals, digital natives, people that are, people that are trying. So wrapping up our welcome, uh, everybody. please, everybody take a look at our Discord channel. Um, just to wrap that up real quick, we certainly have a lot of work to do around here and we love everybody to um, take a look. Reach out to us in general if you're new to the community or if you're amongst any of our guilds, um, you know, please uh, find contacts over there. So without further ado, I am very excited to start today's call. We have an incredible agenda lined up. Um, we're going to be uh, starting off our call today with an incredible guest. We're very excited to welcome Adam from Compound. Um, he'll be presenting a slide deck for us today and uh, telling us about all the incredible things they've been working on. Um, we move into a weekly product spotlight, and today's weekly product spotlight will be TBTC with Bo. For those of you who know, Bo is in the know. So I'm very excited to have you on today. Uh, part one, Bitcoin scripting. I'm going to wrap that with a little Q&A session, um, an awesome time for everybody to unmute and ask questions at that time. We're also happy to read your questions in general, or if you want to navigate to the right-hand portion of your screen, we have an in-call chat as well. So please uh, get your questions ready for Bo, and uh, we'll be very excited for that spotlight. We love to do our Threshold DAO update every Friday here in Discord. We have some incredible contributors and amazing contributions. Very much looking forward to our weekly update. And at the top of the hour, we're going to be giving everybody an incredible oat today. Uh, we've designed a nice one for everyone today. Nice to add to your collections. Happy to provide instructions async, and we do provide a full month for everyone to claim it. So as long as you're in the call for 15 minutes or longer, You'll be good to go. I'd love to hand the mic off to a very involved and active contributor of our community, East. And if you'd be happy to take it away, I'd, I'd love to have you introduce Compound. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nico. Uh, can you hear me well? You sound good. You sound like you're next door. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, so today's guest is Adam B. from Compound Labs. Uh, let me do a quick intro to Compound. Everybody knows Compound, right? It's one of the few really OG blue, blue chips Ethereum protocols out there. Um, Compound was uh, founded back in 2018 at the time when the lending and the borrowing landscape of the crypto industry as we know it was still really in its early stages of development. Uh, today, uh, Compound is used extensively by, by regular people in DeFi, but, but also and most by DeFi developers uh, who programmatically integrate it into their DApps and use the protocol for dynamic borrowing and lending. Compound and Adam himself uh, were on one of our first community calls in Tally Hall. 
And the wallet integration into Compound occurred really, really fast and really early in the beginning of Talif Ho. So I must say they are really, really cool guys. <laughs> Let me please all welcome uh, Adam, who will walk us through Compound. Welcome, Adam. How are you? Hey, good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, as I said, uh, I, I think you have a, a slide deck uh, to share right. and, and, and to tell us a little bit about Compound. Absolutely. Let me share my screen. Yeah. Looking good, good Adam. All right. Thanks so much, Threshold community, for having me in your call. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about Compound in case you're not familiar and sort of go into details about the protocol itself in its history and also the latest updates. So uh, like was just announced, I'm Adam. I'm the developer relations lead at Compound Labs. I've been working at Compound for three years. And I'm available on Discord if you ever have any questions about Compound. If you're building a project on Compound, I can help you out with your code, help you out with your uh, concepts. I'm a developer educator, happy to help people build on Compound. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about the protocol, differences between V2 and V3. V3 was launched at the end of last year. And we just have uh, a new deployment that just came out a few weeks ago. And we're deploying on our, our first um, chain other than Ethereum very shortly. Uh, we're going to be deploying on Polygon. So that will be out in the coming weeks. So very exciting stuff coming from Compound. And I'll tell you a little bit about the protocol's governance and some developer resources. So like I said, I work at Compound Labs. We are the authors of the Compound Protocol. It is a protocol made up of many smart contracts running on Ethereum, and it's been running since 2018. Our mission is to create efficient algorithmic money markets. So what gets me excited to work in the DeFi space is that we author and also continue to steward decentralized, free, and open tools that everyone with an interconnection, internet connection can use. <clears throat> so this includes everybody that has a bank, everybody that is underbanked, and also people that are unbanked. So anybody with a, an internet connection, you have a cell phone in the middle of nowhere, you can use Compound, you can use DeFi. So th that just gets me very excited to work in this space, very excited to be uh, helping move this along, uh, this future technology. So if you think about everyone on Earth with like a smartphone and internet connection that can use DeFi, can use Compound, it's like a huge market. And it's just very exciting what we'll see in the future. So the Compound protocol, historically, we've seen interest rates for suppliers as high as 15% APY on USDC, as well as several other supported assets. And I love that what we were doing is different from TradFi because DeFi systems are transparent, they're voluntary, with public ledgers where code is law. And uh, with DeFi, you get decentralization and transparency, unlike centralized banking and financial systems that are totally opaque. So those are some things that get me excited to work in the DeFi space. So what is the protocol? If, if you haven't heard of Compound before, it's simply put, it is crypto asset money markets. So we refer to it as the Compound Protocol. It runs on Ethereum, soon to be other chains as well. And it is decentralized, which I'll explain how it's decentralized shortly. The main use case is it allows suppliers to earn interest on their cryptocurrencies. And the other main use case is you can permissionlessly borrow other cryptocurrencies. So instead of an asset like Ethereum or USDC sitting idle in your wallet, you can supply it to Compound and earn a varying interest rate. So users can supply crypto collateral and borrow a different crypto asset against their collateral. 
the interest that suppliers earn is driven by the interest that borrowers pay. So those are the two basic uses of the protocol for everyone, earn interest on crypto or borrow other crypto. It can only support crypto assets that are tokenized on Ethereum or other EVM chains as ERC-20s. It allows suppliers to earn a variable interest rate on their assets and an individual that uses a DAP like the ones listed on the compound.finance homepage or the, uh, the app that we host at app.compound.finance, uh, they can use the protocol permissionlessly. So developers can build their own app as uh, use the protocol as interest earning infrastructure and users or organizations can use those interfaces to earn or borrow. And uh, use cases we see are um, any business that holds funds for a period of time, they'll put it into the protocol and earn some interest on those assets. And uh, that, that's better than having them sit idle. And we see a lot of crypto wallet applications using the protocol to earn interest for their users automatically. So here's an example of using Compound. Uh, let's say you have um, want access to one of many interface applications for the protocol. You can supply to Compound. And when a supplier supplies, they get a fixed amount of C tokens, which you can think of as like a coat check for your underlying assets. And as time progresses, more underlying can be redeemed for the same amount of C tokens in version two. So you can think as time passes, interest accrues for the C token holder. And in V3, uh, C tokens are only minted for supplying the base asset, not for collateral assets. And uh, the C tokens are one-to-one -one rebasing. And there's several more differences between V2 and V3. I'll discuss that later. But this is the, the general idea. You supply, you get a C token, and you earn interest on your supplied asset. <laughs> controls. There's an on-chain governance system that I'll also cover later. And C tokens are redeemable at any time. Uh, interest accrues every Ethereum block, about every 12 seconds nowadays. And this enables on-demand supplying and redeeming from the protocol. No need to wait for a lockup period. You can earn interest for supplying for as little as one minute, one block. Pretty cool stuff. So here's the other main use case. The protocol enables over collateralized borrowing of assets. So a user can supply a collateral asset before they borrow, and they can only borrow up to a certain amount of USD value of their collateral. So the total value of their collateral is always worth more than the total value of their borrow relative to USD. So this is how the protocol will stay uh, solvent and safe. So an example of this would be to supply a collateral like uh, WBTC, uh, WETH, or maybe someday T, uh, TBTC. Uh, and you can borrow a smaller value of that collateral as a different asset, say DAI or USDC, or one of the, the many other supported ones. So uh, you could do that as long as your account is still over collateralized. So, uh, the collateral factors will be something like a, a percentage. So if you supply like $1,000 worth of WEATH, you can borrow up to 65% of that as USDC. So you could borrow uh, $650 worth of USDC. So once the asset is borrowed, it's um, held in the user's wallet with no strings attached. Uh, however, the collateral can be clawed back later if the account becomes liquidatable. So that only happens if the price of the collateral drops significantly or the interest accrual uh, goes too high and the, the user has not repaid their borrow or topped off their collateral. So liquidators keep the protocol safe and collateralized. They're incentivized to do so. So borrowers that become under collateralized are subject to liquidation and they can lose some or all of their collateral. And due to the autonomous nature of the protocol, the liquidation system is much harsher than traditional finance. There's no negotiating. 
and there are no delinquent repayments allowed with the on-chain code. So the liquidation process is very harsh and swift. So here are the 18 supported assets by Compound V2. This is the protocol that's been running since 2019, the, the version that's been running. And each of these assets can be supplied or borrowed from the protocol. Uh, not all of them are eligible to be collateral. The community determines risk factors based on the asset's reputation. So say USDT, the community does not trust this asset as valid collateral. So this collateral factor is 0%. You cannot borrow other assets against USDT, but you can supply or borrow it. You can earn interest if you supply, and of course you can borrow it against a different asset. So these are the assets supported by Compound V2. And this is the, the cool part, this is the new part. Uh, Compound V3 has been out since, uh, I think it was August of last year, we, we uh, deployed the first version on um, Ethereum mainnet. Compound 3 is a little bit different. It's um, more gas efficient and more capital efficient than Compound V2. It focuses on a single asset that is borrowable or um, able to earn interest per deployment. It streamlines the most popular use case of V2, which is supplying a volatility priced asset and borrowing a stable price asset like USDC. The first deployment is uh, USDC is the base asset, so that is the only asset in this version of the protocol that can earn interest, and it is the only asset that can be borrowed. So um, the base asset focus makes it so opening positions in V3 have less stacked risk than V2. Currently, there are two deployments of Compound3. Both are on Ethereum mainnet, and they are USDC and with uh, base asset deployments. There, of course, are more to come soon. There is a, a new one coming on Polygon in the coming weeks. And this version of the protocol is able to, to be deployed on any EVM chain, unlike Compound V2. And the key differences are that V3 has less risk, less gassy, and it can be deployed anywhere that solidity is supported. So V2, you can borrow any supported asset, but V3, you can only borrow the single base asset per deployment. So compound V2 and V3 coexist. V2 is not going anywhere. Uh, there's no deprecation schedule. And the use case of V2 is somewhat different from V3, so users are still using it at high volumes. Uh, so yep, they're smart contracts. They live on forever. There's no deleting them. So compound V2 is not going anywhere. So here are some Key differences, uh, Compound V2, you supply an asset, you get um, a differing amount of C tokens. Uh, it's about 50 to one, but that, that rate is always changing as time goes on. You can always redeem more underlying for the same amount of C tokens, uh, each progressing Ethereum block. So you get like a, a weird amount if you supply in Compound V2, you get a weird amount of C tokens. Uh, a lot of people will supply and they'll get all these C tokens that won't make sense to them. Uh, Compound V3 is a little bit more simple to understand. It's 1-1 one, one rebasing. So you supply uh, 1,000 USDC, you will get 1,000 CUSDC V3. And as time goes on, the balance in your wallet will go up as you earn interest. Another key difference is that in Compound V2, you can borrow any asset supported by the protocol. And in Compound V3, there are multiple deployments. And in each deployment, you can only borrow the single base asset. Uh, so Compound V2 is a single system with many assets. Kind of think, it is a, think of it as a big monolithic structure. And Compound V3 is single asset focus, fewer contracts, less complexity. Uh, V2 is just one protocol deployed on Ethereum, and Compound V3 is multiple independent EVM chain deployable uh, protocols. So you can have many deployed on many protocols, and they are all independent of each other, encapsulated, do not know about each other's existence. In V2, the max borrow and liquidation are the same. So if you borrow 
the maximum amount, you will get liquidated in the next block. So it's very unwise to do that. Sometimes users who are inexperienced will do that and they'll get liquidated and be very upset. Uh, Compound V3, the liquidation point and the maximum borrow are separated such that the liquidation point is always higher than the maximum borrow. So you can borrow all of the possible borrowable uh, value in a single transaction. And there's like a no new borrows slash grace period between that and the liquidation point. So you can uh, borrow all you can borrow. And then your account is just technically not um, solvent, but it, it can get liquidated at a later time. So you have more time to either supply more collateral or repay your borrow uh, before you get liquidated. Uh, V2, you can earn interest on any supported asset. And in V3, you only earn it on the base asset. So you can only earn on USDC and WEF at the moment. Uh, those are the two base assets and the two deployments. In V2, some assets are invalid collateral, like USDT. But in Compound V3, all of the collateral assets are, um, they, they all have collateral factors, so you can borrow against them but you cannot earn interest on those collaterals. Uh, Compound V2 has an integrated comp distribution. It's part of the comptroller. It makes the contract much longer and more complex and upgrades are more dangerous like we saw uh, back in September of 2021 when the comp distribution bug happened and tens of millions of dollars worth of comp were um, wrongfully claimed from the comptroller. This was due to a, a very complex code bug that occurred. So in Compound V3, there is an encapsulated comp distribution, part of a rewards contract that is completely separate from the protocol. No need to upgrade it. Um, no need to change and break anything. So uh, a bit less complexity there, a bit safer. Those are key differences. I know there's a lot of information. I'm happy to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, getting there. Uh, governance is uh, the decentralized Decentralization of the compound protocol. The contracts are available at the GitHub repo. The comp token breaks um, the ownership of the protocol up to uh, the 10 million tokens that uh, users can earn if they are using the protocol. And you can vote or you can propose changes to the code of the protocol using your delegated comp. So the community is responsible for all the changes made to the protocol. Uh, the comp token is released in uh, June of 2020. Users started earning it as they uh, supplied and borrowed from the protocol, and um, users delegated it to their address, and they can vote or make change proposals for the protocol. Here is the schedule for creating a proposal. It takes about one week to make a change proposal. You can uh, initialize a proposal if you have uh, 25,000 more comp delegated to your address. The community can review it for two days, then they can vote for three days, yes or no. If the vote succeeds, the code change is queued into the time lock, and there's two days where developers that use the protocol can make changes to reflect the changes coming from the governance proposal. And then after the two days, it is executed, and that code is changed on chain, and the protocol has a new version. So here are some resources. If you want to learn more about Compound, you can go to docs.compound.finance to learn about the technical details of the protocol. You can come into our Discord to ask questions. Uh, the whole community is there to help you out with your project or just explain concepts if you're a little bit fuzzy. We have a blog at bdm.com so you can read up. And we also have the code on GitHub. So that is my presentation on Compound. Happy to answer any questions. That was really an incredible presentation. Um, I, I thank you for putting such a complete uh, slide deck together. Um, and yeah, love to open the floor up. If uh, everybody wants to take it away, I see East is ready with one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Adam, that was incredibly interesting. Uh, thank you so much uh, for presenting us. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, maybe the first one is uh, onboarding uh, new assets, <laughs> like the mentioned uh, TBDC. Uh, the the current process, I I know it's really hard to get onboarded, uh, but but can can you explain a little bit around that? Sure, uh, happy to explain that. Um, 
So the community, it's, it's definitely akin to like a political process. You have to convince the other community members that the asset is worthwhile to be supplied as collateral uh, to the protocol. So if you want to have a supported asset, the best thing to do first is to uh, come into the Discord, um, ask about it in the governance channel, and to also create a forum post on the, the comp.xyz forums. I realized that URL is missing from my presentation. I should add it. It's uh, comp.xyz. You can go there, and it's a discourse forum. That is primarily where new asset listings are discussed. Um, people will make a forum post, and they will explain with great detail why this asset should be added to the protocol as collateral and uh, give some metrics on it, um, maybe create like a little forum poll to see how much interest there is. And uh, gauging that interest is the first step to getting community support and once you're able to see that the, the community does indeed want this asset uh, added, you, you see some uh, camaraderie, then uh, you, you can find a pro uh, someone who is able to propose a protocol change, and you'd have to uh, add that asset parameters to uh, the, the protocol as a governance change, and then everyone can vote on it on chain. So it's a bit of a complex process. Um, happy to... Um, demystify any of that if it was a little bit, a little bit um, complex. Uh, no, I get that. I, I think uh, you were mentioning this. Th this is around V two, right? Is V three uh, something different? Uh, how, how is that uh, working with uh, with V three? Yes, it's the same process for both V two and V three. So um, okay. for V three, it's multiple protocol deployments, though. So if you want to have a collateral. Uh, it could be added to multiple uh, deployments on V3, or you could uh, propose making a brand new deployment where your asset is the base asset. Okay, that, yeah, that, that's really <laughs> a big difference. Right now, you mentioned that there are two uh, base assets uh, right now, USDC and WE. Uh, Correct. And that for collaterals, you get no interest. But does that mean that you have other uh, assets that uh, work as collateral and you can uh, borrow against that? Or is still USDC and WE the only assets out there in V3? Correct. So for V3, those are the only assets in which you can earn interest and borrow. But the collaterals are just sort of like um, only collateral. They, they don't earn interest, but they are collateral against your borrow. As well. Okay, but you have other uh, assets that are there working in V3 right now. Yes, so for uh, for USDC, I believe the collateral assets are WEF, Link, Comp, okay. yeah, WBTC. Uh, okay, okay, right, right. So uh, uh, yeah, being a uh, base asset uh, means that that's the borrowable uh, asset, right? And you get uh, interest on it. Correct, correct. Yeah, great. Uh, excellent. And it, you mentioned you, you get C tokens, uh, kind of different C tokens, one, one being on V2 and one being V3, that they're completely different. Uh, on V3, it's like a representation of what you have uh, in a, at the base layer, right? Right. So in V3, uh, you only get C tokens if you supply the base asset, and those are interest earning. Okay, sounds great. Um, Nico, are there any questions from the community? You know, um, been kind of scanning the chat and um, haven't really seen any. I, I have to say, Adam, you gave a really complete presentation today. It was it was very incredible. Um, but of course, um, I do invite everybody um, if you're you know driving home in the car or if something pops up when you're you're thinking back about compound later on this evening, we'd love to answer all of your questions um, asynchronously. So you're welcome to post those in general um, later on. Adam, um, I didn't know if you wanted to share a link to your Discord or 
you know, if you want to throw any of your other contacts in our chat stream today. But um, gosh, I, I'm very excited about uh, the protocol and I'm, I'm really just looking forward to everything that you have to offer. Some really incredible news you've shared with us today. Yeah, uh, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. I posted a link to the Compound Discord in the general chat. You can, of course, ask questions there. You don't have to ask them at me directly. Uh, the whole community is there to help you out, uh, but I'm also there to help out. Fantastic. Yeah, I just can't thank you enough for your time today. Really great having you on the show. We, we'd love to have you back and uh, love to, you know, love to stay in touch with you asynchronously so thanks again thank you thank you adam see you around we are back onto our agenda um what an incredible update get my slide decks going and going to welcome our next guest onto the stage. And yes, um, we're really excited to have Bo come on with our product spotlight for today. Um, for those of you who don't know, <laughs> you want to know Bo. And if you don't know, now you know. Um, Bo, very excited to, to see today's product spotlight. What we're going to do is um, we'll just um, allow you to uh, share your screen and um, any any other information that you want to share. And at the top of your presentation, we'll have some Q&A. So if everyone wants to post their questions in the chat while Bo is presenting, and um, we'll uh, we'll be happy to uh, to take note of those questions. You can also post questions in general, and we'll take a take a peek over there and uh, bring those questions up to the stage for you, Bo. So um, without further ado. Take it away. Very excited to see product scripting. We uh, are you guys able to see me? Yeah, you look great. Must be chilly where you're at. I love the sweater. <laughs> it's a little cold. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to start though. recording, and then we have this whiteboard rocking and rolling. Uh, if someone else also wants to record, just in case mine doesn't go through, that would be appreciated. Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, Bitcoin script today in specifically the context of how our deposit system works. So I think one of the like less understood things about how uh, TBTC V2 deposits are operating are like, what are you actually sending your money to and why is every deposit address different, which is like a pretty big change from I think how like a lot of more traditional Bitcoin systems are working. So I first want to tackle uh, like how Bitcoin script works, like what the model of ownership is, and then use that to segue into explaining uh, V2. So let me grab a, a note real quick, and then we can get on our way. Uh, so for Bitcoin, um, or I guess let me contrast this with Ethereum. When you want to send someone tokens or uh, or like money, on the Ethereum blockchain, we send it like to a particular wallet address. So like you're able to send it to like a smart contract, you're able to send it to your friend and you're putting their like wallet public key directly into like the transaction. And then when they receive money, it's sort of like a, like a bank account balance update, uh, which is a number going up and down. Like your number is going to go down when you send them like a thousand USDC and their balance is going to go up. Uh, there's like a historical ledger of those transactions, but when you're looking at those funds in your wallet, uh, it's not like a whole bunch of little dollar bills. It's instead just a number in an account. Uh, this is different than how we operate with cash in real life, for example. So like if I wanted to pay Nico um, like $100, like I might give him five different $20 bills. And then when he puts those in his wallet and he looks back at his wallet later, he has a bunch of individual bills. And this idea of like little individual bills or little coins is actually how Bitcoin is operating. Uh, so the idea is at, a, at like a really high level, uh, every time you want to send someone money, in, in Bitcoin lands, you do it by looking at your little individual coins and then sending those coins, which we call um, unspent transaction outputs, UTXOs, 
uh, to someone else. And the way that sending them works is you, uh, every coin is locked using uh, like what we call a locking script. And you have to be able to unlock it and then relock it in such a way that only they are able to unlock it in the future. Um, which sounds relatively complicated, like not, not the easiest way we could have accomplished the same thing, but it does allow for a lot of flexibility. And so we're gonna dive into what like a locking script is and then an unlocking script and then be able to understand like how this is able to simulate sending someone money. Uh, so first we have to understand uh, like the Bitcoin script and the stack. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna display a stack using a different color. I'm gonna display a stack sort of like as a, as a bucket. So this is the stack. And then can someone chime in and tell me if everything's legible? This is this. Awesome, thanks Nico. So this is the stack uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna put things in the stack. So like maybe we'd have like a five here and a 10 here. So things are things are going to go in that stack, and we're going to say this is the bottom of the stack, and this is this is the bottom of the stack, and this is the top of the stack, and then things are going to keep stacking up. One of the more important things to think about for stack style like data processing is when you put something on the stack, it's sort of like a stack of plates. You can only put something on top of the stack, and when you want to look at things in the stack, you can only look at the top of the stack. Like you can take something off inspect it, do some data processing, and then put something back on. So a, a, con, like a really, really simple Bitcoin script might be uh, like five, 10, um, add, and then 15 equal. And this might sound like nonsense, but the idea is Bitcoin script, there's no loops. So you can't just like arbitrarily go through it. We're going to process each um, little instruction one at a time. And data like five and 10 and 15 uh, just go directly to the top of the stack. And then there's functions like add and equal. And those are going to process the stack in some way. Um, and so what we need to have happen at the end of the script is for the stack to just contain a one. Um, and so if we were to run this script, we would put in the five and then we would put in the 10. So five and then 10. What add does uh, is it's going to take the two top things off the stack. So five and 10 go away. It adds them together. And then we get 15. Puts that back on top of the stack. Then we're going to put another 15 on the stack. And then equal takes the top two things off the stack. Puts a one if they're equal. Otherwise puts a zero. So 15 and 15 are equal. So we get a one. And our stack ends with just a, like a singular one in it which means that the script executed successfully. Um, so this is like how a Bitcoin script works. And there are more functions than just add and equal, but this is the sort of the fundamental idea. We're gonna run things left to right, one instruction at a time. We're putting things on a stack. You can only take things off and put things on top of the top of the stack. And we're trying to end in exactly a one. Um, so if this is the whole Bitcoin script, then we can sort of split this up into which parts the, the, the unlocking script and which parts the locking script. So I'm gonna say that this, we can call, call like the locking script. And this is the unlocking. And we could have chosen to split this up however we wanted, but the idea is 
when uh, when you want to move Bitcoin, you have there it'll already have like a pre-supplied locking script, and you have to supply the the beginning part, the unlocking script, so that the whole thing evaluates to just a one. And the idea is we're trying to make supplying an unlocking script difficult. So if 10 add 15 equal is our locking script, it's easy for anyone on the Bitcoin network to be like, oh, the proper unlocking script is a five. So if uh, I was feeling generous and I locked up some Bitcoin using 10 add 15 equal, then it would be a race for all of the like collective computers in the world to unlock it with a five so that it's now it's their Bitcoin essentially. And then they would relock it to themselves using a, a much more difficult script to solve. Um, so, so that's what's going on here. There's always a locking script, which is like the tail end, and there's an unlocking script, which is the front. And that's, that's how you uh, spend money, and you would relock it using whatever locking script you'd like. Um, one of the fundamental scripts, you can think of it as like, what does sending someone money mean? Because if I just sent that script, I'm effectively sending everyone money. Uh, is this idea of dupe hash 160. And then we're going to get a like bow pub key hash. So this is hard coded. Uh, and then bub bub key hash, and we're going to get an equal verify, and then finally a check sig. So if this is the locking script. then we can have a unlocking script that looks like bow signature and then bow pub key. And so the idea here, this is unlocking. The idea here is that there are functions within Bitcoin that are able to check to see if both signature matches the public key. This is what the check sig function does. And then there are functions that are able to take things and hash them. So for instance, hash 160, would take bow public key and turn it into bow public key hash. So when we execute this script, uh, we start with the unlocking. So bow sig goes here, and I'm just gonna write sig because it's faster. This is a signature, uh, and then the pub key. And then what dupe does is it's going to take whatever the top thing on the stack is, uh, and then put another one. So now we have another pub key. Hash 160 takes the top thing off the stack and then hashes it, puts it back on the stack. So now we have pub key hash. And then we get another pub key hash. Uh, equal verifies, going to look at the top two things on the stack. Uh, and then if they're equal, we just continue. If they're not equal, we just fail everything. You can't unlock the coins. So because they're equal, we're good to go. So we can get rid of those stack elements. And then check sig is going to check to make sure that the sig matches the public key, which is a cryptographic function. And it does. So we replace this with a one. If it didn't, we would have put in a zero. So at the end of the stack, uh, we have our singular one 
and we're able to relock the coins. Um, the reason this works is because if, if I use, for instance, like Nico sig, but bow public key, then the check sig part is going to fail. It's going to put a zero in here. So Nico has to either use my signature, which he can't produce without my private key, or he has to use his public key, but then that doesn't match this, the bow public key hash. Because when we dupe it and then hash 160, we're going to get Nico public key hash checked against bow public key hash and the equal verify will fail. Um, so what this does is it makes it so that when uh, someone locks a, a Bitcoin a, with this particular script, do patch 160, bow public key hash, equal verify check sig, then effectively only me who has the bow private key is able to relock this coin. So that's what we mean by spending Bitcoin or sending it to someone else. Um, and that's sort of like the fundamental idea behind uh, like both Bitcoin script and how Bitcoin transactions effectively work. Um, the next part, we can take a look at a more complicated script, which is our deposit script. I'm going to jump straight there. So what we're doing is we've got your ETH address, which is weird on Bitcoin, and then drop. And then we're going to do our blinding factor. Drop. And drop is just going to delete the top item of the stack. So effectively, we're going to add something, immediately remove it, add something, immediately remove it. I'll talk about why this is important in a second, but you can think of these things as doing effectively nothing in terms of moving Bitcoin around. Then we have a familiar script, dupe, hash, 160. And then the signing groups public key. So the hash of their public key and then equal. So this should look just like what we were doing. And then we have if. We have a little bit of control flow in Bitcoin script. Check sig. Else. Dupe. Hash 160. Refund. Sub key. Hash. And then equal verify. And then we get almost done. Lock time. Check lock time. Verify. and then drop. So what this does is it uh, uses like a timestamp. So we're going to provide a lock time. Uh, and then if when this script is executed, our current time is before lock time, then check lock time verify is going to fail. That's all that's doing. And then we're done. We have our end if. All right, there's a lot here, and this is the locking script. Um, what we want to provide is the same thing we were just looking at. So for instance, we want to provide, we have two options. We can provide the, the signing group signature. 
the SIG, and then the signing group public key. So this is our unlocking script. So the idea is we're going to stick the ETH address in the stack, drop it, put the blinding factor in the stack, drop it again. Uh, and then we have our signature and public key already. So those are SIG, pub. Then we're going to dupe that and then hash 160. So if you remember that's a little construction from earlier, now we're going to have a pub key hash. And then we're going to get another one right here. So a pub key hash. And then check to see if they're equal. So if they are equal, we're going to get, you know, a, a one or a zero. Depending on whether or not these things are equal. And if we're providing the signature and public key for the signing group, then it's going to be a one. If we're providing some other um, public key, we're going to get a zero. And then if, and what if does is it looks at the top thing of the stack. If it's a one, then we're going to do this stuff. If it's a zero, we're going to do the else stuff. So if we provided the signing group public key uh, in here in our unlocking script, we get a one. So it's a check sig. And check sig is going to look at if the signature matches the public key, which if we provided a signing group signature, it will be, and then we complete. We're, we're finished and we're able to relock the funds. And so what this effectively does is say, uh, like all of this at the beginning is just a regular locking script that we see all over the place. With the addition of ETH address drop and blinding factor drop at the beginning, which don't affect execution meaningfully. Uh, what they do let us do is sort of stick arbitrary information onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And so when someone looks at this transaction later, uh, they're able to see that you specified your Ethereum address and the blinding factor, which is like something that makes each deposit unique. Uh, if we provided a different public key, in our unlocking script, then this is going to be zero. We're going to hit this else block. And then we're going to sort of repeat the process. Dupe hash 160 is going to make a new public key hash of our public key. And then we're going to check that against re the refund public key hash. So this is what lets us uh, send folks their Bitcoin back uh, if something bad happened. But they can only do it after the specified lock time. And so if you, when you send your Bitcoin, you're going to currently make this lock time nine months in the future. And so for the first nine months, effectively, only the signing group public key is able to move these funds. After that, then both the signing group and the refund public key are able to do it. Uh, so we're going to check lock time verify. That's going to output um, a number, or sorry, that either fails or doesn't. If it doesn't fail, we need to get rid of lock time. So we, we drop it. And then that's going to leave us with uh, just the um, just the signature that we were able to verify. So Pretty incredible um, stuff, Bo. <laughs> it is amazing to watch you. You always have a way of, of simplifying everything and it just i love watching you at the whiteboard incredible well, I'm glad to, super glad to hear that you're finding this at least a little simple uh it's i know it's oh, like no. complex uh, it, is, it is very very <laughs> high level stuff so <laughs> um, 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 yeah we're, we're kind of approaching the top of the hour i wanted to uh you know kind of hand it over to john i didn't know if um if there were any major questions out there but i also wanted to just remind everybody um we're we're certainly happy happy to get your questions answered asynchronously as well if uh yeah absolutely if, uh, we're running yeah, up to the top of the hour and we might miss some so well yeah, exactly. you do the download so update very quickly after but definitely if there are uh, any any questions let's let's get those in. 
Um, and we're going to have Bo back. This is first of a series. Yeah, it's just incredible to watch you to watch you at work, Bo. <laughs> Quick question in the chat about the lock time stored. Um, is it in numbered blocks? It is a timestamp. So it'll be, uh, if you're familiar with like Unix time, it's just a number that I think represents the number of seconds since 1970. So it's, it's in real life time rather than block time. Um, typically each Bitcoin block is about 10 minutes. So we, we could have used blocks and it wouldn't have been, uh, it wouldn't have been important, but the Bitcoin designers um, gave us this nice way Makes to sense. use actual time. So we use that instead. Incredible. And Bo, we cannot wait for your next installment. Uh, just really thank you for your time today and thank you for, for such a great presentation. Yeah, absolutely. I love opportunities to. Yeah, it was because they get you some hot cocoa to go with that sweater. <laughs> I hope you're staying warm wherever you're at. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thanks, yes. Bo. Um, you know, John, I'd love to have you take it away. Everybody on the call, um, in the respect for your time, you know, you're certainly welcome to uh, to adjourn for the day. Um, the oat is available, but um, John, if you'd like to, uh, I'd love to hand the mic over to you. Yeah, sure. I, I'll do the DAO updates quickly, but um, if someone can watch the chat, if there are questions that come in for for Bo, uh, those are even more important, and we can uh, we can get you know feel feel free to interrupt and get those in. So um, last week's community call uh, was a, a, a banger, as, as Ash tweeted. Uh, so we not only had Matt doing a, a product overview and demo of TBTC, uh, we had Arjun from uh, Connects. I love that quote from him down there at uh, the bottom left. Uh, TBTC is such an obvious and important piece of infrastructure that needs to exist right now. Um, we also had Derek from ETH Denver uh talking about the uh opportunities there the culture um biddling and of course threshold is a significant sponsor at ETH denver we're doing a lot of things the marketing guild's got a lot of <coughs> things in the works uh preparing for ETH denver including some really cool bounties um, and other things um in the upper right um matt did a uh, Twitter space with uh, Chris Black from um, Black Report um, the other day. Um, you know, if you know Black Report, uh, it's uh, sort of that proof of decentralization. So really tough, hard hitting questions on how decentralized uh, a protocol actually is. Um, Matt did a fantastic job uh, fielding those those questions, and it was quite a quite a deep dive. Uh, it sounds like there may be a, a, a second one because uh, uh, it was only an hour, but the replay is there at that link on the upper right. Um, shout out to um, our 101 XYZ courses and Ashley for creating and promoting those. Um, uh, the most recent one, Intro to TBTC, has over 1,200 completions and it's only been, I think, a week. The first one we did a while back is over 8,600. Um, I keep uh, including the link in to set up a threshold node, the step-by-step uh, -step video that uh, our, our tech support uh, Victor um, created. He's walking through the documentation um, uh, that he wrote on setting up a, a node. Um, and then the link at the bottom right uh, actually goes to uh, Matt's uh, demo. It goes over to our, our YouTube uh, channel. So we'll uh, publish this uh, slide and the re replay as usual. Um, all the links will be in here. Uh, um, so I would say, are there any other questions for, for Bo if, uh, if he has a few minutes? And we, uh, we had a uh, really good uh, presentation by Adam and thorough on on compound so uh it's tricky sometimes to figure out the timing of of each of these definitely and we really appreciate everybody sticking around for a little bit extra today we love to respect your time but uh what an awesome update john 
there's so much exciting things happening in our DAO. I mean, it is just, it's such a great time to join the DAO. If, if you haven't, if you're a contributor and you're looking for a home, uh, we would love to have you. So, um, and it's just amazing to see the organic growth that has, has been building with our DAO as well. So John, I, I just appreciate you doing the DAO update. And uh, of course, I love to send a shout out to all of the contributors. I'm a member of the marketing guild, um, John puts together these incredible presentations for us each week. Um, of course, we have other other amazing contributors as well. But um, yeah, just wanted to you know take two minutes to thank everybody for the behind the scenes work. Amazing. So without further ado, we are a little bit over time today. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this week. I want to invite everyone back. Uh, we are here every Friday. If uh, you hop into our Discord, check out announcements. You'll see the time and date of each in your local time um, as a uh, a uh, friendly way uh, discord helps us manage time zones but um also the most thing i wanted to say is i'm releasing uh the dow or the um the oat for today uh, please take a look at the slide uh, you'll have a full month to claim that um galaxy does a wonderful job of tracking everybody that comes into our calls and um as long as you were with us today for 15 minutes should have no trouble claiming that if you do have any questions um please take a look at our oat claiming instructions here in discord or you can reach out directly to galaxy with that, I wish everyone a happy and wonderful Friday. I hope you guys have an amazing weekend and uh, a special uh, thank you to the Philadelphia Eagles for giving me something to do this Sunday. I hope everybody has a great weekend. <laughs>Yeah, and if anybody has another minute, uh, I just asked Bo a question in the chat um, on differences with uh, TBC v2, um, the, the way that the protocol works with with BTC. Um, so we can either look for that, or uh, maybe that we take that into the next uh, next session that Bo does. Yeah, I can I can answer it in voice if anyone wants to stick around, and then yeah. write something up in in the message as well for the folks that didn't. And yeah. we'll talk about it next time. It's any, like all of those sound like a good idea. Um, so we'll do voice first. The, the main difference between how V1 handles Bitcoin and how V2 handles Bitcoin is that in V1, uh, every time you wanted to make a deposit, you would, uh, there wasn't already a wallet that existed for you. Instead, uh, you signaling that you want to deposit some Bitcoin causes the system to generate like it's going to pick three people randomly based on their stake and then they will come together as node operators to create a wallet uh, right then for you so that like it's a three of three wallet essentially um behind the scenes it's threshold signatures and it's like the t and dvtc but uh they're creating a wallet and then they provide the the address that you send the funds to um and when you send those funds that's the only time that wallet will will be used to receive funds so each deposit gets its own address um for tbtc v2 wallets are created uh every two weeks currently i think we're going to ramp that up to a week uh soon but every two weeks in advance and then all deposits for that period are going to go to that wallet um, and so this makes it a little more difficult to know like who you should mint to because you're creating the wallet in advance. It's not like uh, one one wallet is for a particular mint like it was in V1. And so in order to um, differentiate all the folks depositing the same wallet, uh, what we do is we make it so that when you send the funds to the wallet, you include information about your Ethereum address and uh, like your blinding factor, which would differentiate uh, deposits to the same wallet from the same Ethereum address. Then uh, when on Ethereum, you let folks know that you did this and they're able to go find your deposit because they can match up the, the Bitcoin script 
to what would be what would exist in the Bitcoin chain. Uh, so this is what allows deposits to be verified that they're yours on Bitcoin. And so the way that we handle the transactions ends up being different. There's uh, one final layer of complexity that I didn't get to because we ran out of time, but that uh, we take that whole script, which is like this long, difficult to compute and read thing, and then we turn it into what's called a pay to script hash in Bitcoin. So you take the hash of that entire script and then pay to that script hash. So it ends up just being this compact address. Uh, then when someone wants to spend the funds in the future, like for instance, the wallet needs to make a redemption, uh, it needs to know ahead of time what Bitcoin script would have hashed to the address that you sent to. And it can know that because all the information to compute that is on-chain. Um, but until you tell Ethereum, like if you were to just secretly make a deposit and then never follow up, your funds would be, they would look like any other funds sent to any other paid script hash address. It will be, you know, separate and unique. So you, you have anonymity until you reveal that what you've done on Ethereum. And that's how the bridge works. Wow, thank you. So it sounds like E2 is not only um, an easier a uh, process for the customer, the depositor, the you know the number of steps, and it has greater security. But also, sort of behind the scenes, there are additional you know, upgrades. Uh, you mentioned the anonymity and, and other things um, that um, improve the sort of the the process. Um, I'm wondering if if any of those also impact. Uh, like the, the gas costs? Yeah, and a lot of it was for gas optimization specifically. Like Because we're not creating tons of wallets, uh, like for instance, previously, if you wanted to have 200 deposits in a week, then you would have to register 200 wallets on Ethereum. Uh, and then all of those redemptions would be individual, which they all have to have the proofs on Ethereum. Here, we're only registering one wallet for like two weeks worth of deposits so with high volume that's like you know over 200x cost savings depending on how many deposits you're getting in a week um the other thing is that with sort of like the v1 system and a lot of other ways to do bridging but to make multiple transactions we're able to accomplish all of the minting in a single bitcoin transaction like where you fund the wallet and a single ethereum transaction where you reveal what you've done and so it's uh, wildly less gas. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, and obviously, the you know complexity can be the enemy not only of uh, you know security, but you know users um, engaging in, in various things. So it sounds like a ton of work to you know to balance all of those and. Uh, figure out you know which ones we're optimizing for, but sounds like we've improved on on all scores. I'm certainly happy with it. And it sounds like users are too. I, I uh, was going to put the uh, latest stat in the DAO update. Uh, we're just about at 300 uh, BTC last I checked. So it'll be fun to pass yeah. that. Past that threshold on the way to a thousand, ten thousand, fifty thousand, and fees, revenue. Very exciting. All Great. Right. Well, this has any more questions. I always I have a lot, but uh, I'll step back. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Uh, I think uh, leave it open for a little bit longer and just see if there's anything else that pops up in the chat. And then uh, there's still a ton of folks in here. It sounds like people want to listen to answers. Now we just need questions. Yeah. yeah, and thanks for being flexible, Bo. It's uh, you know, um, I think it's good that we're doing this ongoing uh, series so we can pick up some of these things in your next one. You always draw no a nice problem. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's it's incredible information. It really is. Yeah, Victor, we'll find yeah, out about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am Victor. I'm not a lawyer. We're an astronaut. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Ash has the proper spelling for the, the crypto question. I'll make sure I put my Ethereum address in the chat for you both so uh, you can get all those refunds. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Nico. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Ash, is the is the bot able to answer in here too? I didn't realize. Maybe it isn't. Usually, when people ask when moon, it has stuff about when we first landed on the moon. All right. Yeah, I don't think. Oh, I have that's adorable. For loaded in here. Yeah, I'm going upgrades to uh, the uh, response bot as well to to reduce the amount of time that uh, teams and others have spent answering questions over and over. Victor asks, uh, when are we thinking slashing will roll out? Um, I do not have access to timelines. I try to stay pretty far away from, from getting those sorts of dates. Uh, but if, so that'd be a question for like Piotr or Matt, but I don't think either of them are on the call. Um, I can tell you that the general progression of like what we're trying to develop is that we are trying to make sure that the system is stable first. Uh, and we're doing that with our like beta staker program. And in like, while we're doing beta stake or beta, <laughs> beta staker stuff, slashing is way less important, but as we open up the system to make it, so you, you could be like a permissionless mentor or, you know, whatever it is, then having economic disincentive to misbehavior, which is exactly what slashing is, becomes more and more important. So we can expect that slashing will exist before uh, being like a, a node operator is free reign. But as far as I remember, uh, Victor asks, where do slash tokens go? Are they destroyed or are they transferred to an accessible address? It's the second. Uh, so we're not just going to be lighting tokens on fire. Instead, I think they go back uh, to the person who reported the misbehavior. Like some percentage of them, it might be 100. Uh, so it's like a big prize for you being vigilant and checking to see if someone else is doing something nefarious. Right, and as a reminder, this first phase, you've got the minters and guardians, right? So there's there's no slashing yet, um, but essentially they are performing, you know, those that oversight, you know, role um, as a group and and you know, kind of manually, and it's a one event. Mm -hmm. uh, we will continue in the future to have minters and guardians even after everything is permissionless. Um, and the slashing will be for the folks that are actually custodying the underlying Bitcoin. And if they commit some sort of fraud, um, or fail to like mince or fail to redeem or, you know, any of those sorts of misbehaviors, uh, then that's what they're risking. Um, as we move towards the sweeping system, then that will be happening like in parallel with this optimistic minting that we're doing. And so if uh, like right now it takes, I think about four hours for optimistic minting to work, we're going to drive that number down. Uh, there's a, a couple of techniques that should make that quite a bit faster. Um, but in the, like in the background and simultaneously, we need to be able to uh, relock the Bitcoin that's sent to these wallets with like the, the time lock refund. Uh, we need to be able to relock that with a script to just the wallets that doesn't have the refund. Um, or someone could, you know, mint some some TBTC, wait nine months, and then refund the underlying Bitcoin and have both, which would be disastrous. So we have effectively nine months in order to 
build the switching transactions correctly. And those are the ones that are con that consolidate all of the deposits to the wallet without the refund part. Um, if if that process, if the consolidation process happens before uh, optimum segmenting happens, uh, so like if just if that process is faster or if the, if no one wants to mint something like all the mincers have decided to censor or corrupt or whatever, or if all the, like if some guardian is just voting no over and over on an otherwise like good looking deposit, then the backdrop of the system, the sweeping part will still mint you your TBTC. And so it becomes uh, like the minters and the, the guardians become less important. And that's all working. Interesting, but you're saying they still interest in guardians will still play a role even when we're in the permissionless phase. Yeah, and so what they do is provide speed ups. So, for instance, the plan is to do this like sweeping process that I'm talking about on an eight hour schedule. And so, if you deposit like one hour after the most recent sweep, it would have normally been seven hours until you got your CBTC. Um, what the minters and guardians will do is allow that to happen effectively, like in an hour and a half or two hours, once we get everything sped up rather like, and then you have this constant worst case scenario of like two hours rather than worst case scenario being like almost eight. Okay. Yeah. Matt was actually talking about that on the black report, uh, Twitter space, um, in the context that like, if you want to be. Um, you know, extra safe and secure. Uh, you can you can wait the the full amount of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. So once sweeping, which is what we're calling it, is in place, there will be no longer a permissioned set of folks that are able to commence to BTC. So you don't have to worry about, you know, getting centered by guardians or mentors anymore. Wow. So many things to uh, keep track of, you know, think about, optimize, <laughs> and see how they relate, right? Um, security, usability, censorship resistance, uh, timing. It was a, yeah, it was a complex system to design, for sure. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, and thanks for coming on to present and answer so many questions looking forward to absolutely the next me too does anyone else have anything that they would like me or anyone else to answer when's part two uh, i <laughs> i don't do my own scheduling so that that's up to Y'all and Will, I would say. I think we have next week uh, plan, but uh, maybe it's the following one. So yeah, we'll we'll follow up. Sweet. And thanks again. Really great, Bo. Thanks, Adam, and everybody. Excellent session. Thanks for. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Have a great weekend, everyone. You too, Ash. See you, everybody.